Okay, so we are on Daf Ayin Tet, and uh, the topic tonight is leather. Uh, the first amud is going to be uh, untreated leather. What's the minimum amount for carrying? And uh, the second side of the daf will be about klaf and duchsostos, uh, treated leather, on which one writes mezuzah and tefillin, and the minimum amount for that. So if we go back to the Mishnah, we'll see that od, which is untreated leather, kedela sot kameya is for an amulet, whereas duchsostos is for a mezuzah, and kelaf. Uh, is for the first parasha, the smallest parasha in Tefillin, which is Shema Yisrael. Okay, so let's discuss the untreated leather. Ba'aminea, Rabba me Rabbi Yochanan. Rabba asks Rabbi Yochanan, Rabbi Yochanan, Nachman, a question we're going to see, he actually is going to ask a series of nine questions. So uh, this is an extended discussion. The question is, Hamotzi or Bekama? This is an easy one. It says right in the Mishnah, enough to write a amulet on it. Okay, well, that was a simple answer, uh, but this was only a setup for the next question, which is, uh, gets successively harder. If one actually tans leather, what's the smallest amount? If you just tan a uh, one centimeter square of leather, and uh, that's okay. What's the smallest amount if you tan leather to violate tanning? Male loshina, same thing, the amount for a to write a kamiya. Le obdo bechama, what if I'm going to take it, I'm going to carry it outside with intention that I will tan it, although it's not tan now. Male loshina, same thing. Minatemra, what's your source? How do you know that it's the same, uh, same amount, even though it's not tanned yet, but it's going to be tanned? Kiditnan, Mishna says, we see that in all the things that one does with wool, uh, making it white and combing it and dyeing it and spinning it, is the amount is, uh, the smallest amount is the rohav sit kaful. Sit means uh, the width from, from the first finger to the third finger, if you stretch them apart, I would say about, I don't know, two and a half or three inches, double that, six inches, that's the smallest amount. And that's because, so you see, it doesn't matter whether it's already spun or pre-spun, all right? Because this is the amount for spinning, but whether it's pre-processed or processed, it's the same amount. And so therefore, by analogy, we can say that for tanning, the, whether it's pre-processed or processed, it's the same amount. We happen to quote the rest of the Mishnah, even though it's not relevant. Ha'oreg shetechotin shiudo kimlo rochav hasit. It should not say the word kaful. It's not in manuscripts. Uh, weaving is uh, one seat, not double. Alma, anyway, from the first one, from the first half here, we see kevan delitve ka'e shiura kitavui. Since uh, it's meant that this wool is going to be spun, so it's as if it's already spun. It's the same amount. Uh, that for spun wool is the same amount for unspun wool. So here too, since my intention is to eventually tan this leather, it's uh, the same amount, although right, right now it's not tanned. So that's why it's the same. How about a harder question? Let's say I have leather and I don't intend to tan it. I'm not taking it to be tanned. Maybe I'll tan it one day, maybe not. It's just a piece of leather. My leloshena still doesn't matter. Still the same amount. Hold on. Okay, now hold on, right? Whether, and this applies both to, to questions three and four. Are you really not going to make a difference between something that is pre, not processed and something that is processed? And now we're going to ask from three different cases uh, where there is a difference between something processed and unprocessed. First one, itive, hamosi sammanin shiruyin behen dugma le'ira. If I have spices that are meant for dyeing, and the first step is to take the spices and uh, leave them in water to, uh, to soak in there. So if I take soaked spices, uh, then the minimum amount is to color a, a, uh, a sample, a sample swatch. A sample swatch, the size is usually enough to cover a spindle uh, so that it, uh, it controls uh, the, uh, how loose the spindle will, will spin. And so that's a small amount. Ve'ilu b'samanin she'enan shiruyin tenan, k'lipei gozim ve'klipei limonim, 
Satim Upua, Kedel Litzba Bahen, Beget Katan, Lefi Sebacha. However, if the spices are not in water, in other words, they're raw spices, pre processed, then carrying has to be more, has to be enough. These are all different things that were used for spices and different colors, like um, uh, pomegranate uh, 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 peels and so on. This is enough to make dye to, um, to uh, cover a small piece of cloth that would go on top of a hat, which is a bigger amount than uh, just for a sample. So you see that regarding spices, processed, processed spices uh, would be require a smaller amount than unprocessed processed spices in which carrying is a bigger amount. And so, so too with leather, you should say a different amount for unprocessed and processed. That's the question number one. And the answer is, Haitmad Allah, Amad Nachman, Amad Abba, Bad Abu, Abba Bad Abu already said about that Mishnah, the fish and Adam Toreach, Lishot Samanin, Lisbo, Behen Dugma, Leida. A person would not bother to uh, start a process of uh, soaking these spices in order to make just a small amount, just to make a sample swatch. In other words, you know, it's not worth, it's not worth the trouble. And so therefore, if it's unprocessed, then a small amount like that is not worth anything. It's not significant, right? Someone would only, the minimum amount to even start the process, the minimum threshold to make it worth one's time would be to make a hat. And so there, that's, that's the reason why there's a difference in spices before unprocessed and processed. However, with leather, it's a different story. With leather, the process of making leather is equally, uh, a, a, is equally hard, no matter whether it's a, just a small piece for a, an amulet or something bigger. And so therefore, a person would take the trouble to uh, tan leather, even if it was only a small piece. And therefore, there's no difference in leather between a bigger size and a smaller size whether it's processed or unprocessed. So leather works differently than spices is basically the answer. A side point here is that Rabba Bad Abu is a second generation uh, Mora and Rabba is a fourth generation. So you see that um, he could, Rabba Bad Abu could not have said this as a, as a response to Rabba's question to Rav Nachman. And actually it's not even presented here as a response. It says he had already said about this Mishnah that there is such a distinction. And in fact, this statement of Rabbah Bar Abu is going to appear in Ten Dapim from now in a different context. So Rabbah Bar Abu already made this distinction about this Mishnah, and now uh, we are appropriately applying it here to answer this question. Okay, question number two, had, uh, uh, challenge number two, the Mikamed is that in Hu Tenan, talking about how many seeds, right, number of seeds uh, is the minimum uh, for uh, planting if you carry them. Before they're planted, it says that on that on egina pachot mekegero get it less than a date a dry dateful of seeds uh, it would be um, would be okay a dateful would be not good. The biudab and betirah med hamisha is more machmir five seeds. Okay, five seeds you carry it's no good. But however, of ilu batad desar inu tenan. But if they're already planted and something's growing, then what's the minimum number of plants that's significant? If you have different kinds of fertilizer, um, uh, whether manure or thin sand, that's used as fertilizer, the minimum amount of fertilizer you'd be chayaf for carrying is one cabbage. That's what it would be akiva. They say one leek. Anyway, it's a leek is smaller, but the point is one plant is enough, is already significant. Whereas regarding seeds, you need at least five, according to the Buddha, and even more, according to Tanakama. So which is it? You see here that pre-processed, when it's just a seed, um, it's, uh, it's, it's many. Where post-process, after it already grew, then just one plant is significant, which makes sense. After processing is more significant, the amount should be less. So to hear regarding leather, why don't you say the same thing, that unprocessed leather should be a bigger amount because not so important, and after it's processed should be a smaller amount. That's a challenge to uh, Rav Nachman's opening, uh, uh, opening statement that says there's no difference. Our answer is the same as we said before. When it comes to seeds, no one bothers to plant one or two seeds. One or two seeds are worthless, right? It's not worth your time to go and out and dig and all that. 
So therefore, if you carry one or two seeds, you're patur, because nobody, it's not useful to anybody. It's not a significant amount. However, after it grows, then one or two uh, plants is significant. Now it has value. So you can compare seeds to leather. Leather doesn't change. It's uh, still valuable. It's worth tanning the leather even for a small amount. So a similar answer. This one is called by Rav Papa, who does come after Rava, and so actually could have said the statement about um, in, in response, although it still says Hayit Mar Allah as if it's said somewhere else. So we don't know if he said this regarding in this context or about something else. But either way, it answers the question. And now a third challenge. Regarding clay, that if it's pre-processed, we saw this at Talmud actually yesterday, um, that uh, the rabbis agree with Rabbi Shimon. The rabbis had different um, levels of amounts for different liquids. Rabbi Shimon said, always a Rabbi Eit. But everyone agrees that if you bring wastewater outside the Shut Rabim, the amount is a Rabbi Eit. Because you would be used, what would you use wastewater for? It's all dirty. You can't, you're not going to wash with it. You're not going to drink it. You could use it to mix with, the, with, the, with clay and make clay. So the minimum amount of making clay would be a revirit. However, once it's already mixed, the minimum amount of clay, of finished clay, is amount to just put in a um, uh, in a urn um, in a crucible to make a hole in it and uh, stop up a hole and make a hole for uh, for the bellows to go into, which is just a small amount. And so you see that uh, clay before it's processed, it'll be a lot of water to make a lot of clay, but after it's processed, only a little bit. So you see the difference between pre-processing and post-processing. Why don't you say the same thing for leather? Same answer. If you're going to come and make some clay, you're not going to make just a tiny bit of clay. The minimum amount that's worth your time to make clay is going to be revi'it. And once you make it revi'it, you use it for this, you use it for that, and you, know, you, uh, you remember all the things that you need a little bit of clay for. Um, so therefore, the post-processing is more valuable than the pre-processed clay, uh, which requires more. However, tanning is the same no matter what. Okay, so we solved all those problem, problems. And now we're going to have two more statements regarding it, challenges. But this one is not from, a, not from Tanitic sources, but from Amoraic sources. There are three stages in the preparation of, of leather. And the first one is masa. Matza is when it looks like a piece of matzah. It's not uh, to- totally raw. There's no, you didn't put salt, you didn't salt it, you didn't put flour on it, and you didn't put gall nuts on it. Those are, those are the different steps. It's just plain leather. That's called masa. What's the shi'ur, the minimum amount for carrying uh, matzah? Tane, Rab Shemuel bar Rab Yehuda, kedeh latzor bo mashkolet ketana, enough to wrap a small weight. Right, the weights were made out of lead and soft, soft material, and if you kept using the weights and rubbing them, then they would uh, rub off and get lighter, and so they would wrap the weights in leather, but you don't need any fancy leather, even the plainest untreated leather is enough for that. And so that's that would be just a small amount. How much is that? A quarter of a quarter of the measurement that they used in Pumpedita. Okay, so that's matzah is enough to cover a weight. Chifa, that's the second stage of uh, tanning leather. We get to learn a lot about how to tan leather here. The maliach velo kamiach velo afitz, where you put salt on it, but not flour and not gallnuts. And kamashiro, how much? What's the minimum amount for that one? Kedetnan or kedela sot kamia. Oh, this is the one that's going to make for uh, for making an amulet which would be smaller than the previous one, right? Because now it's more valuable, uh, a smaller amount is, is valuable and therefore is chayab if you carry it. Diftera, and the third stage, the maliach v'kamitz v'lo afitz, that you put flour, but still not the gall nuts, v'kam ashiure, k'deh et haget, 
and this would be, and yet an even smaller amount to write a get. Nowadays, gitin are long because we had a lot of extra words, but fundamentally, a get just has to say, you can marry anyone and have the names and the dates and the witnesses. And that's all, just a few lines, a small amount, and that could be enough for a get. Katani mihat, kedei lasor bo meshkolet ketana. Okay, the point of our question is that if it's untreated leather, completely untreated, what we called matzah, then uh, it's just a it's, a, it's a larger amount than an amulet. It's enough to cover a weight. So you see that according to Ula's statement, there is a difference between uh, treated, untreated leather and treated leather. And that goes against Rav Nachman. All right, we can answer that question. Hatam bebishula. That's talking about fresh leather that is still is still wet. It was just came off the animal and is put out to, in the sun to dry. And so that leather is not treatable. It's not yet ready to be tanned. And so that's a different category. And that category, when it's uh, and at that stage, would uh, be only be used to cover uh, weight, but couldn't be used for other things. So that's a different category altogether. And so it's not the same as Rav Nachman, who's talking about pre-treated leather, but that's dry. Okay, and our last challenge from the Mishnah, We saw this Mishnah a few days ago. What's the smallest amount of a piece of cloth that it would be... Uh, that if midras means if a zav uh, sits on it, what's the minimum amount that would become tameh? If it's clothing, it's three by three tefachim. If it's sack, what's made out of goat hair, four by four. If it's leather, that's the key, it's five by five. If it's mat, then it's six by six. Okay, tane ala habeged vehasak vehaor keshiur letuma kach shiur lohotzaa. And we have a baraita about that, that mishnah that says the amount, the minimum amount for becoming Tameh is the same as the minimum amount for carrying outside on Shabbat. And so now you see that or leather is five by five. And so that's a different amount then uh, for writing an amulet. But again, we can answer Ahu be kortubla. These are all Greek words. Uh, this is boiled leather that to make it hard that would be used as furniture cover- covering. That's what it's talking about. You can see it's associated with different kinds kinds of cloth. Um, and matting. And so since that is treated in a different way, the, that, the size of that is different from the one we're talking about, which is leather that would be intended for tanning, eventually for writing. So the last two, so the, these, these three challenges all have the same, uh, same answer, that in other items, pre-processed is uh, bigger than post-processed amount because the post-process is worth more and you wouldn't bother to process unless you had a certain minimum threshold and that's not true by leather. And these two um, are, are, are the answer, response to these two is that's talking about different types of leather than the one that Rav Nachman was talking about in our Mishnah. Okay, that concludes the first Amud and the dis- discussion of untreated leather. And now we'll talk about treated leather, Keta, Kelaf, so let's explain these terms. Uh, the hide of a cow, um, when you take off the skin, it can be split apart into two layers. The first layer closest to the flesh of the animal is called dochsostos, a Greek word. And the layer above that, the outer skin, is called kelaf. Um, on either way, you always write on the on the part that's touching each other, where the klaf and the dosostos meet. You would write, in other words, on the outer part of the dosostos and on the inner part of the klaf is generally where you would write. If you keep them together and don't separate them, and you tan it that way, you get gevil, which is very very thick uh, leather. Okay, so in general, uh, klaf is which is finer is used for Tefillin, and dochsostos is used for mezuzah, right? That's the general, but now we're going to, although we're going to question that. So now we have, uh, we have a, we have a, a problem, um, a contradiction. In the Mishnah it says the smallest amount of klaf is enough to write Shema Yisrael in the tefillin shel rosh, just one, okay? So that's a small amount. But we have a braita that says both klaf and dochsostos 
is the smallest amount is to write a mezuzah. And as you know, a mezuzah has two parashiyot in it, which means klaf, the smallest amount is to write two parashiyot, which is a lot bigger than the, the Braita says, as two parashiyot, which is a lot bigger than what the Mishnah says, which is one parasha. So we have a problem here. So we're going to try one answer. My mezuzah, mezuzah shebetefilin. When we say mezuzah, we don't mean a mezuzah that's on the door, but rather mezuzah can refer to the parchment that's inside the tefilin. Really? Do you ever call that in that inside? Uh, to inside the tefilin, a mezuzah? The kari lehut tefilin mezuzah? Who ever heard of that? In, yes, I have a source, a braita that does in fact say that. Batanya, this is what tefilin, ima tefilin metameot et hayadayim. Bifnei atzman, and this is Braita talking about Tumat Yadayim, and it says that just like touching a parchment of a Torah scroll makes your hands Tameh, and the reason is because we want people to be careful and to treat it with, with respect, so they won't be touching it so often. So the same is with Tifilin, and the first opinion says if you touch the straps of the Tifilin, um, that makes your hands Tameh, um, but not if they're not attached. Only if they're attached to the tefillin. The Bishimon ben Yehuda Omer, Mishum Rabbi Shimon, and Nogeh Bersua Tahor Ad Shagia BeKatzitza. No, if you touch the strap, it's okay. Only if you touch the end where the tefillin, the tefillin box itself, then your hands are tamei. The Bizakai Mishimo Omer, Bizakai also in the name of Rabbi Shimon has a different version. He says Tahor Ad Shagia BaMizuza Atzma. You're okay unless you touch the mizuza itself. Well, from context, you could see that we went from the straps to the box to, what do you mean the mezuzah itself? Not going, jumping to the door to a different item. You're talking about the klaf, the parchment that's inside the mezuzah, inside the tefillin. You see, it can be called the mezuzah. Okay, fine. So that's what we're talking about. And so that resolves the question. Because here, when the baraita says, klaf or dochsostos, enough to write a mezuzah, they don't mean mezuzah, they mean tefillin. And the one and one uh, one chat one paragraph. And it's the same as the Mishnah. All right. Well, it's so far so good. But the problem is when we quote the rest of that Braita, it was not going to work. The the rest of this Braita, the one that we quoted above, that said Urminhu. The continuation says Kilaf Kedelichtov Alav Parasha Ketana Sheba Tefilin Shehi Shema Yisrael. It says explicitly Klaf is for writing Tefilin. So you see that that's the second half. The first half must have been talking about mezuzah, because the second half is talking about tefillin. So even if you can find some source where mezuzah means tefillin, it doesn't mean that here. And so now we go back to our original question, in addition to another question, which is that the two halves of the Braita contradict each other, because the first half says klaf is a mount for a mezuzah, and the second half says klaf is enough for tefillin. So that this this baraita is self contradictory. So we must have a problem with a problem with the with the nusach of this baraita. So instead we reread it. Hachi katane. This is what it really means. Kalaf vedoch sostos shiuran bekama starts with a question. These two items. How was the minimum amount? Doch sostos kedel lichtov bala mezuzah. No, they just if you just add a second doch sostos kalaf vedoch sostos. What's the law, right? And so, Tuchzostos only, that's for a mezuzah. And Kelaf, Kedelich Tov Alav, Parashat Ketanash Betefilin, Shehi Shema Yisrael. Okay, so in that way, we resolved the, uh, the problem from the Braita. We had a wrong version of the Braita. The Braita itself actually agrees 100% with the Mishnah. Klaf is what the outer layer, that's what you write, it's finer and stronger, that's what you use for Tefilin. And so therefore, the minimum amount for that would be just one paragraph. Right, smaller amount, and doxostos, uh, which is the layer closer to the flesh of the animal and is, and is thicker, that's good for mezuzah, and that would be a larger amount for writing two paragraphs. Okay, so now we're all good, and now the rest of the daf, the rest of the uh, amud, is going to be talking about this statement of Rav. Rav has a different opinion than the majority. He says, doxostos hare hi keklaf. It's the same. Dochsostos has the same use as kalaf. In what sense is it the same use? We'll see a different opinion all the way at the end, but right now. Ma kalaf kotvin alav tefillin. Af dochsostos kotvin alav tefillin. Usually, I know, we write tefillin on kalaf, on the upper part, but if you want to write your tefillin on dochsostos, it's okay. It's kasher, according to Rav. All right. Now we have a number of challenges uh, to this. We're going to have four challenges and one proof for it. Uh, 
The challenge number one, Tenan, Kedaf, Kededik Top Parashak Ketana, Shebetefidin, Shehi, Shema Israel. Hold on, which this is our, our Mishnah, Kelaf in Dochsostos law, right? This is our Mishnah, it says, Kelaf is the smallest amount is for writing the Parashah of Tefillin. It sounds like Kelaf is what's used for Tefillin, right? Kelaf, yes, and not Dochsostos. The answer is the Mitzvah. The Mishnah is talking about the, the, doing the Mitzvah the best way, right? Mitzvah min hamubchad. Best to use Kelaf. But if you use Dochsostos, it's still okay. So Mishnah is giving you the typical example, which is the best way to do it. That doesn't mean that's not the, it's not the only way to do it. Okay, Tashema halacha Moshe misinai tefillin al kelaf. There is right a tradition from Har Sinai that tefillin is written on kelaf and mezuzah al dochsostos. Okay, so that's pretty clear. That's uh, what's called the statement A and then statement B and then statement C says kelaf b'makom basar. That's C. Dochsostos b'makom se'ar. That's D. So when you write uh, a kelaf, that kelaf which is the outer layer. The outer layer, the topmost layer, should be written um, on the inside of it. Next, that would be facing the basad. While the dochsostos, which is the inner layer of skin, closest that's closest to the to the to the flesh, you should write on the outside of that one, closest to the where the hair grows. Even though the hair doesn't grow on the dochsostos, the hair grows on the cloth, right? Point is what we said before that you have the dochsostos, which is closest to the animal, and cloth on top. You should write on the top of this layer and the bottom of this layer. Okay, so here we see that this assumes that kalaf is for tefillin, dosostos is not for tefillin, it's for mezuzah. That's a question on Rav, because he said that you can write tefillin on dosostos. Again, the same answer, le misvah. We were just talking about here about the best way to do it is to write it on kalaf, but tefillin, really you could uh, also write on dosostos if you wanted to. Okay, patanya shina pasul. I like how the Gemara, you know, withholds the rest of the Baraita, right, and lets it out little by little. The, this Baraita continues, if you change, pasul, right? You have to do it exactly this way, and if you don't do it that way, no good. So it can't just be for mitzvah. You really have to do it. You know, the, the avad, is, uh, uh, changing is, it a prob- is a problem. Answer, a mezuzah. When it says, if you change it, pasul, that's talking about mezuzah. Don't change anything about the mezuzah. Don't write the mezuzah on klaf. Okay, but tefillin you could write on dosostos. All right, well, let's read the continuation of the Beraita. Actually, the whole Beraita actually says, Shina baze u baze pasul. <laughs> so how are you going to get around this? It said, if you change in this or that, which we seem, seem to think, me, seems to mean, if you change anything about the tefillin or about the mezuzah, it's pasul. Tefillin only on kilaf, mezuzah only on dosostos. No, no, no. Baze baze is not referring to A and B here. Rather, it's all talking about mezuzah. And the point is, don't write the mezuzah on kelaf, um, uh, on, on kelaf that's on the upper half of the kelaf where the, where the hair is, and don't write on doxostos that's closer to the flesh. And so the EDVED is going on parts C and D. And not talking about tefillin at all. Okay, so um, now we uh, resolve that problem one way. A second way of resolving it, that it, the question of whether you can change around and change a klaf with tochsostos is actually a machlok at tanaim. And it's true that this paraita said you can't do it and you can't change, but it's not the only opinion. And Ab is following another opinion of this paraita as follows. Shina baze baze pasul. Ravacha machshir mishum rabbi ache bar hanina. Amila mishum rabbi akob ber bi hanina. It's two versions about who said uh, it's okay, but there's a tana that says it's kasher. And Rav follows that tana, and that's why he said, Dosostos can be written on tefillin, because he follows that, that, uh, that, that tana. So that's a good answer, right? It seems like they, that would be the best answer. We try out one more answer. It ends up being rejected. Rav Papa Amar, Rav de Amar ketana de be menashe. Rav has yet another tana that he can follow. It's from the house of Rabbi uh, of Menashe, the tana de be menashe. Ketabal haniyar, bal hamatlit. If he wrote something, we're not sure what he's writing yet. If he wrote, wrote this item on paper, bal hamatlit, or on cloth, pesula, no good. If he writes it on kelaf, gevil, bal dochsostos, 
Kilaf is the upper layer. Gevil is both together. Dochsos is the lower layer. It's kasher. Ketavamai. What is he talking about? What is he writing? Ilema mezuzah. Mezuzah. Kilaf mi katvinan. It says you can write it on Kilaf also. And mezuzah can't be written on Kilaf, so it can't be mezuzah. Elaf tefillin. It must be tefillin. All right? And so therefore, you see, tefillin can be written on Kilaf or dochsostos. So that could be a proof for that. Hold on, Wait, but no one thinks that you can write tefillin on gavil. No one ever heard of that. So it can't be tefillin. This whole thing is talking about writing a sefer Torah that you can write on all three of them. And so therefore, Rav cannot be going. This, can, this, this cannot be a support for Rav at all. So forget that proof. But we have these uh, two other proofs, so we're okay. All right. Uh, with, uh, two, other, um, two other answers, responses. Okay, so we, um, we resolved the four uh, challenges to Rav's opinion. And now we'd like to bring one possible support. The beginning of the Spiraita is not quoted here. It says that you can take Tefillin Shal Yad and make it Tefillin Shal Rosh, because that goes higher, but not the other way around. And similarly, Tefillin that are worn out. Uh, and Sefer Torah, Shebala, Sefer Torah that's worn out. Enosin mehen mezuzah. You can't take them and use the, you know, cut them and use that uh, clap, use that material to write a mezuzah. The fish en moridin me kedusha hamura le kedusha kala. Because Tefillin and Sefer Torah are a higher level of kedusha, and it will be degrading to use it for a mezuzah, which is a lower level. So now we analyze this. Tama de en moridin. Hamoridin osin, the only reason that you can't use tefillin for mezuzah is because you don't go down in level of kedushah. But if not for that problem, it would be okay. Dichtiva amai, and what is it written on? Dab dichtiva adochsostos. Is it not written on dochsostos? Right, it would have to be. And so you see that the tefillin is written on dochsostos, and that's why you can write it on mezuzah. And so there's a proof that uh, for Rav that says you can write tefillin on dochsostos. Since so look here, it says you can use it, you would be able to use it for tefillin if not for the other pro- side problem of lowering kedushah. Lo, dichtiv al kilaf. No, who's, who said? Maybe the tefillin is actually written on kilaf and now it's worn out. You want to use it for, tef- for mezuzah on kilaf. Wait, mezuzah, kilaf, mi But wait, now you're saying a different chidush that you can write a mezuzah on kilaf. But we said before, you can't do that. In, no, I, I have another source that, in fact, you can do it. Batanya, in fact, uh, we have a Baraita. Kitab al Kilaf, al Niyar, bal Hamatlit, Pesula. Amar Abi Shimon, generally, if you write a mezuzah on any of these things, Kilaf, paper, or um, a cloth, no good. That's the majority opinion. However, Amar Abi Shimon ben Elazar, the Bimeir hayak kotva al Kilaf, mipne shemishtamedet. He has an evidence that the Bimeir used to write his mezuzah on Kilaf. Because it holds better, it will it will it will stay good for longer. Klaf is stronger, and so to be meir did in fact. He's a minority opinion, but he did in fact write mezuzah on kilaf, and uh, and so therefore um, this is not a good proof uh, that that tefillin can be written on dochsostos uh, because maybe it's talking about a case where if tefillin written on kilaf, and then maybe it's like to be meir, and uh, you're writing, you're going to use it, reuse it. You would reuse it if you were allowed to. Uh, on a mezuzah made out of cloth. All right, so this is, we end up not having a proof from here. However, now we just learned the chidush that there is someone that says you can use tefillin, you can use cloth for mezuzah. So he said, Wow, now once you told me this chidush, that there is an Atanetic opinion that says you can write a mezuzah using kilaf, maybe we misunderstood Rav all along. And we go back up here to the statement of Rav. Rav said, Perhaps he only said those words, right? He said there's a similarity between them. And we, we assumed that the similarity was that you can write tefillin, where usually you write it on kilaf. It's the same as dochsostos, and you can write tefillin on dochsostos. But maybe all along, we misinterpreted it. And what I was really saying is that, um, the other way around, that mezuzah, which is usually written on dochsostos, oh, you can also use kilaf for it. And that would be a completely different reading of Rav. 
Um, so that's the conclusion. The conclusion is not that we have to read the Rav that way, but that Rav could be read that way because he has a Bimeir, but the other, the previous interpretation still stands as a possibility because all the, all the challenges to, to it were answered. Um, and this uh, proof, although it's not a proof, it's also not a disproof. So we therefore have two readings um, in Rav. And uh, that is the end of the daf. Baruch Adonai Amen Amen. Is this implying that, uh, according to Rav, we originally read Rav as being Mahmir, and now we're reading him as being Mekel? Because before we would read those Sostos, would requ- uh, even would be a problem with a smaller piece of leather, but now we're saying 